and what's what you've all been waiting for. It's a little video. Yeah, go on. Anyone you show me, I ain't. Focus your eyes. The other thing, though, just jumping in, the, the, the other thing is that actually um, you've only got to look one of the, and, you know, who, you know, I, I, but that said, <laughs> the, um, the, the, um, no, no, the, uh, I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> so you've clicked them. <laughs> Hi, I'm Steve. I'm the digital director of Spectrum Group. Spectrum Group is focused on two things, so print management and business process automation. And our mission in life is to help our clients unlock the potential of their people. This is our flagship podcast. So today I'm sat with two colleagues, Neil Wells and John Vanoom. We're talking about all things technology, we're talking about disruption, we're talking about automation and things that are happening in your industry. So wherever you're listening to what the podcast, wherever you're watching the podcast, please like, share, subscribe, share the love, get it out to as many people as we possibly can because it really, really does help us. So with all that said, welcome to Tomorrow's Workplace today. Finance automation then. Um, so yeah, they don't let me out of the office much today. So I'm going to be asking you guys really what's what's going on at the front line. So you're out speaking to customers, speaking to clients every day, talking about automation. What what are people asking you? What what's the kind of common themes that are coming out? And I'm going to start with JV. Oh wow, thank you. Start off a five. Um, in the main, I think mm. the the sort of trend that I'm seeing is that companies are wanting to get much greater control from the point of procuring something through to the whole process of paying for it, the purchase to pay process. Okay. Um, so the conversations I'm having, it's it's about you know a purchase requisition or a purchase order system. So getting that first visibility of what the company's spending that week, that month, et cetera, to, through to actually when the invoices are coming through, Actually, how quickly can we capture them, process them, approve them, pay them, if, okay. if you like? Um, and I think the conversation I'm having with FCs, FDs, etc., is around when they can they can then start using that data to analyze what you know what's going on in the business because often they only get that without the systems that we provide or you know systems out there. What we what they don't have is that visibility until the invoices have come in, and then That's it's suddenly like, right, I've spent fifty thousand pounds on X, Y, Z. Mm. Wow, why aren't we using that particular supplier or suppliers, etc.? So, what if they've not invested at the minute in terms of that um, purchase ordering system? What are they what are they doing at the minute? Is there, is there any control at the front end, or is it simply free reign? People spend what they want, invoices come in. Oh God! Why have we bought that? No, there there, there are controls. Uh, it varies. So some still use the good old fashioned pen and paper, and mm -hmm. you know NCR pads. Yeah. Um, others use spreadsheets. Others have a semblance of a system that they that they cobble together themselves. But ultimately, in the sort of companies, the size of companies that we're talking to, what you find is it, it's more than just a couple of people in the whole business buying things. It's across a, you know, a multitude of different departments. And what they don't have at the moment is that holistic overall view. So with spreadsheets, it's more complex. Um, it's you know, uncontrollable from a, mm. uh, you know, a, a pad. <coughs> but yeah. when you know, maybe through spreadsheets and, and then cobble together systems, you can get a bit of an idea of what a department's spending. But if it's not all joined up together, then it's not particularly, you know, Powerful is it? So is that is that the main advantage you're seeing then of putting a system in around that? Is that is that kind of visibility of spend? Is that the main kind of I think advantage it, or is there other stuff? I think it's two it's twofold, Steve. I think absolutely having that that um, visibility to spend mm -hmm. earlier. So once it's bought and you know because if you've approved it, and then equally when you come to the processing side of supplier invoices, if it was already approved. At the forefront with the PO, and you, you know the the authorization has been sanctioned by a director, you know following whatever their protocols are, and then the invoice comes in and matches that, then it can just fly straight through. Yeah, and it doesn't have to then be routed to somewhere or some person even 
to to approve it, it's very much actually, do you know what? Well, they approved it at the start. We spent that money. The goods have come in at that money. Just crack on. Just process. Yeah. So, so it's not just visibility. You said a word there around control as well and approval. So it's yeah. visibility, but also being able to stop people spending money if they don't need to yeah. before it happens. Absolutely, yeah. I saw something the other day, and it, and it it was a good analogy. Businesses know they need to spend money to make money, but it's just they don't want to waste money. Yes, mm. they know that the, yes, they know they need to spend it, but it's it's controlling that spend, like you say there, and and it could be right across the board from expenses through to like you say whether it's purchasing ad hoc items, whether it be purchasing um, stock items or non stock items or overhead. Yes, the every business has got a lot of things to buy. And then it's a case of, yeah, where did they, where does that goods or service need to be rooted to? What budget holder? What mm. does it? How does it need to be accounted for? And and like John said there, quite rightly, it's giving people um, the ability and power at the, the at the start really um, to have an input or control, as opposed to when it comes in, you're thinking, hang on, why have we spent yeah. that much with that person? Who who will approve this? Who will authorize this? Like. And and again. <clears throat> You'd be surprised. Some of the some of the bigger businesses you would expect to have certain processes in place don't. Others do. And and yeah, you've you've got procurement teams and buying teams and and sometimes if it's like a wholesaling type business, it's someone making the sale or a customer rings up saying, Can we have ten items of these? And then someone in sales might have to place the order and then do like a bit of a back to back type system. But um yeah, we, we sort of see a mixed bag of, of sort of things really. But I think I'll I'll go back to it again. COVID has forced people to look at their processes. Mm. I think the companies that are growing feel the pain because it's, it is again, do we hire more bodies or do we become more efficient? Do we actually put systems and processes in there that will help us scale faster? Because sometimes actually hiring a person could be slower because mm. you've got to train them up. You've got to actually find the right person in the first place. So the recruitment process can take a while. Then you've got to get them in. You've got to train them. That might take six months, whereas sometimes it could be quicker to yeah either tweak a system or, or um, add an upgrade to a system that you've already got or again implemented a new fully automated RPA or, or accounts payable type system. On, on that spend piece, do you think what's happening in the world if you look around in terms of inflation the way it is, interest rates going up, people talking about recession around the corner, are people a bit more conscious of actually need to get control of my spending in preparation for some of that? Is that I think that that's, a, that's probably something that they might have been starting to think over the last sort of couple of months. I think some of the business owners that I'm speaking to at the moment, they are seeing it as a bit of a an investment, I guess. Mm -hmm. So some you kind of get two camps, I guess. One is is yeah, we need the system now because otherwise we're at capacity, someone's leaving, someone's retiring, someone's going on maternity. Do we get a temp in, temper expensive? Um will they do the job right and again it's a case of um the handling people's money so you, you're paying someone to actually give you money away you, yeah you, they're actually pay and then again you want that to be as, as as systemized as possible and then you're right i think that will start coming into business owners sort of thought processes around it again but again the costs of things are just gonna go up and mm. up so you're right it's a case of right as a business they're going to have to grow to they're going to either have to put the prices up because otherwise they could, the business is going to go one way. So they're either going to have to grow through increasing sales. They're probably have to pass on the cost of the customer by price increases like most people with RPI. Um, but yeah, then again, others are saying, right, can we put the investment in now and know that maybe year one, year two. Future proof. Yeah, it's a future proof. And I'd like to think that most businesses see that when they look at, investing in proper systems they're mm. not just going to buy a, a big sort of six-figure erp system off the shelf thinking they're going to replace it every year it's a five-year it's a sort investment. of yeah it's a five-year six-year maybe 10-year investment if not you, longer I, john I, 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 just touching on one of a couple of things that neil said i think that one of the things about the, the whole temp temporary staff thing mm. is like you said they, they come at you know at quite an expense and also often you, you have to as you said, spend time, money training them. Mm. Depending because it's it's temporary, 
how much do you train them? So you ultimately you only you get someone to come in, and they're only probably going to do forty percent of what you really need them to do because actually it's no point investing that time to go the whole the whole hog. And I think the other thing is around because of you know what's going on in the world, the cost, etc. Having that we we've said it visibility and control of um, what you're buying because everything costs more. Mm. So actually, if you can then start seeing trends that. Do you know what we're paying? You know, ten pounds a unit over here. I'm going to start getting someone to start looking and seeing if we can get the same thing for six, seven, and you can do it much earlier in the piece by by, by seeing what we're spending all up. You know, what are our top five spends? Mm, let's, challenging it. Let's challenge it and let's go and find something <laughs> somewhere or someone that can do it. Yeah, you know, I think there'll be there'll be opportunities as well. So the people that do manage their money better, like anything, whenever there's a Bit of a boom or a bust sort of scenario. Again, some of the people I follow that they're predicting a yeah with the, with interest rates going up, people are going to start defaulting on mortgages, loans, all this type of stuff. So it could happen a bit like two thousand seven, two thousand eight, where there's a bit of a bubble burst, especially in property. But you might see that in businesses if they're not managing their cash flow properly, businesses will either either go bust or there'll be opportunities to purchase businesses for, for yeah. and yeah. grow that way. But then there's always a challenge when you purchase a business, whether, you, whether you, again, we've done it recently in the last sort of five, 10 years, there's always that struggle of amalgamating different systems, different yeah, yeah. processes, there's different cultures. But um, if you can have a bit of a standardized process, then again, it'll help people to acquire and grow and scale faster. So they could have a bit of a competitive advantage by investing in technology. A business is talking about the what's happening in the economy. Are they is that is it top of mind for people in your experience? Having been out on the road, I um at the at the moment I would I haven't heard it as being at the forefront of yeah. well, like discussions. But I would hazard a guess that you know within the boardroom, it's there, be, it, it? yeah, yeah, it's. I think the, the only thing they've spoke about with us is just, I guess, um, yeah, prices going up and mm. carriage rates and, and supply and demand issues. So if you take the accounts payable process specifically, we're seeing more and more part deliveries and things like that, which impact yeah. the solution. So we're getting more questions around, can your solution handle part deliveries? Mm. Um, can it handle uh, different shipping costs and things like that? So We've seen surcharges, um, aren't we? And yeah, so price was X and, and now your price is yeah. Y, and that's that, true. That's interesting. We weren't seeing that a year ago. Let's no, because orders were being fulfilled a lot sooner. So again, we've got a couple of customers that do order in from like China and whatnot. But yeah. um, and that that makes sense. They'll agree a, a unit price at X, and then it yeah. comes in, and it's six months later, and it's gone up. Um, especially in construction, when timber went through the roof and things like that, and. Uh, on the pun um but yeah uh so yeah we are seeing more surcharges that type of thing but again like i've been saying to some of my customers when you get handle on this and you introduce a system you'll be able to proactively manage your supply chain negotiate mm -hmm. better prices and, and rebates after certain quantities a lot of people are still quite reactive so that they're they're busy uh, and, and they're just getting a sheer volume coming through and they've just handled it the same way they've always handled it, except for, I would say there's been a bit of a shift from, instead of someone just opening the post, they're now opening hundreds of emails mm. and opening a million sort of different attachments and then having to file print them all and go and collate them all. And you're right, with the temp side of things, it's like a lot of the temp staff are having to do that first bit in the process, which we can automate completely straight out of the, mm. out of the gate. I, so I was gonna uh, say, on, on that, and it was it was quite a decent segue in in as much as so at the moment prices are so volatile. So we're talking, you were talking about um, our systems being able to cope with you know where you know carriage charges are changing and potentially unit charges have changed from when the PO was raised. All these sorts of things, and actually one of the things that with any system is only as good as the data that's within it and the accuracy of that data and. I'm now starting to talk to people, not just around the the capture of of information from documents, et cetera, but about the you know the management of data within those systems, and then using robots to be able to start looking at where there's gaps in particular systems, be it CRMs, be it yep. ERPs, and going, do you know what? Um, you know, I've um, got well, it's, it's my my brother-in-law. He's the, the business that he's in. They they're getting like you know they they sell hundreds and maybe even thousands of SKUs 
of you know products and every month they're getting price changes yeah. and then that's someone or people's jobs to go in and go and update it and then be able to send that out to their clients to say you know just for Pass information yeah, we're yeah. passing this on whereas though bots could actually go no problems at all let me go and take that information from your portal or from wherever and i'll go and update the system can do it offline in the, in the middle of the night suddenly mm -hmm. the business is not impacted staff are you know probably adding more value by doing something else like talking to the clients rather than filling in spreadsheets and updating spreadsheets every month okay so that's an interesting point so that's automation being used outside necessarily of that core finance department mm -hmm. i think just a point on the before we move on from accounts payable because a lot of people think about accounts payable as a very standard process you know out the box header and footer solutions there's a lot of them on the market but actually the emergence of surcharges and carriage costs and part deliveries consolidated and invoices consolidated invoices all these things uh if you if we've got people out there thinking of investing in accounts payable they need to be thinking about can the solution handle all of these yeah little elements of complexity yeah you're right the, the ones that you get off the shelf can can do the basics it'll extract data off a pdf and it will present that data it's then what do you do with it and where does it need to go but when you introduce different levels of intelligence that you just said there a lot of the time they kind of hold the hands up and say oh yeah we can't do that but you'll have to continue to do that manually so then then it's a case of orders of magnitude how many of those invoices are um, part deliveries or, or a consolidated invoices and it's asking those questions earlier on in the conversations instead of buying a solution and or seeing a demo and a lot of these demos I see are, are either pre-recorded and they're not personalized whereas we like to take people's data and documents and show them a personalized demo so they can actually see it for themselves working and then drill into that level of detail that you just said there because I've had it before where yeah, you think you're buying a particular system and, and there's a lot of assumptions can be made and that's where we like to sort of get 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 them quashed straight away and just get really detailed on exactly what the system does do and what it doesn't do. Yeah. Um, so everybody's happy with the end result because, yeah, it's never nice either side for delivering something and you think it did this and it, it doesn't. So I think the, the clarity around... Um, the volume of, of invoices, how it's processed, where it, how it moves through the business. The irony is you're writing, you think it's a, a pretty straightforward, but you could have more or less the same business in the same industry and they'll do it differently. Yeah. They'll have some, and it sometimes comes down <clears throat> to the business owners and they'll say, I don't know, I, I trust John to, to buy the right goods. Uh, if, if he's bought it, then yeah, just, just pay the invoice and you don't want to see it. Whereas other business owners want to want to see it at a certain check, mm -hmm. then they want to see it again once it's gone through another workflow yeah. and another check. And it, it depends on how detailed and uh, and again, that's like, like any business, everybody's open to run a business however they, they want really. But, um, but ultimately, because we have to submit our accounts to the Inland Review, uh, mm. HMRC, the, 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 the is obviously legal requirements to do it in a certain way. I mean, there's legal requirements to produce the document, but uh, an invoice in a certain structure. But you'd be surprised on how many that we <laughs> see that don't have the right information on or, or whatever. But even things like that, like flagging a VAT number or the bank details are wrong or something, being able to get to that granular detail and have a bot to do that as opposed to a human. Because mm. again, we all know human... Uh, open to errors and things like that whereas if it's a repetitive thing over and over and over again the bot can do that in sleep really so if there's someone listening watching thinking of investing in accounts payable automation it's un it's important to understand their specific requirements and they find a solution that that meets those requirements Definitely. not something that works for the the real simple stuff i was going to say 100 percent, and just picking up on, on that from neil is if it you know if it's shiny and it's like oh yeah we can implement it in two days and it's like well how can you understand the company's requirements in two days write it up and then sort of build it to meet those requirements it's physically impossible to to do that and then for me you know in anything that I do if someone says oh I can do that you know in in this short amount of time I'm like is it going to meet my requirements? So I think it's yeah. understand. We've I think we've covered this in past pods, but understand your requirements. Understand where your time is being spent because you might only get two hundred invoices, but if they're twenty, thirty, 
20 pages long, each one of them, and they could be consolidated. And actually, do you know what? Even though it's 200, it takes two people full time to do it. Well, there's probably things that can be done and an off the shelf one that's implemented in two days isn't going to be the one that's going to do it. This is Matt. Matt is a finance director and this is Matt's team. Day after day, they trudge through endless stacks of paperwork like mindless zombies. But luckily for Matt and his team, things are about to get a lot better. Since Spectro has digitized their documents, there's no need for physical copies and duplicates to clutter up the office. And with a fleet of Spectrobots to take care of the mundane, Matt's team have changed the game. Don't waste the potential they've got. Get them a robot with Spectrum. Tomorrow's workplace today. All right, so let, let's move away from finance then. So you're out speaking to, to clients all day, every day. What's happening in the world of automation outside of finance? So you started talking, John, around price updates for, for SKUs. Is yeah. that, that's one of the use cases. Any, well, just explain that a little bit more then. Yeah, so you know, obviously in the, in, the, in the world that we're living in at the moment, um, volatility of supply, volatility of, of raw materials, and with that volatility generally comes price increases or, you know, um, and basically, you know, at the moment, if you, if we want if we want to be a, a business to be able to to work efficiently, then they're going to need to make sure that they're charging the right price at the right time, et cetera, et cetera. And so, the conversations I'm having at the moment it, it, it evolves around um, sales orders coming in. Um, but if we, if we stick on the, the price bit, basically, it's being able to update the price lists wherever they're held normally within an ERP system or, mm. or somewhere like that, that actually means that when someone's saying, yeah, you can have 10 tons of whatever, the, ten, the you know the per ton rate is accurate because you know that the, the latest price list has been updated. In your core system. In your core system. Yeah. And, okay. and generally, let's say we've got 100 or 1,000 SKUs, um, having that ability to you know update the price lists you know of an evening so that when everyone comes in at eight o'clock and mm. cracks on again, know that the system's up to date is you know is a, is advantageous, but not really for the client, more for you. In as much as you know, you're not going to be either having to have a difficult conversation. To say really sorry that hundred tons that you just bought, so you know mm. it was the wrong rate. Mm. You can't in the current climate. It's tough to to say oh we'll just take it on the chin. You're not likely to. So having that ability to to update it, you know, and not do it manually because ultimately it's data that has to get from A to B mm. and maybe B to C. But ultimately, if you can do that just using you know, a, an, auto, you know, an automation bot that can just go, all right, I'll go and take that information so and I'll got, move it there. You've got suppliers sending in price lists and where you've got bots essentially then going and opening that price list, extracting information and then going into a core system and updating that pricing yep. for each individual SKU. Yep. Very good. I like that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, automation for me when I'm trying to explain it to customers, it's any repetitive process where you've got someone doing something, clicking the mouse on the screen or, 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 or moving data from one place. Because every business has multiple systems. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd, even though they, they've tried in the past to sort of have one system, even you look at Microsoft, they have a suite of systems or, or softwares. And we, we all want to input it once and it all move around magically and, and, and pre-populate other systems. But there'll be businesses out there that literally have staff sat there entering an order on one, then updating another spreadsheet, then updating another spreadsheet, then updating warehouse, then updating... And it's the moving information around four or five different yeah, places. the same info. The same information that, again, those are the type of processes that we can do. We can do a, a process intelligence sort of audit and sit down with them, map out... And, and do a, a time in motion sort of study. One, map out the process. Because again, a lot of businesses probably haven't done that for a number of years. They've, mm. they've grown, they've got bigger, they've got new staff, they've got busy. When was the last time you actually sat down and mapped out a particular process and asked the question, is this the most efficient way of achieving this? And then if it is, fine. But I guarantee there'll be, there'll be bits in there that 
you could leverage technology, whether it be a bot, whether it be, or a combination of that. And that kind of segues nicely into that umbrella time that intelligent automation has now been um, put out there as a, a, a collective term to cover all of the different technologies that we can use, whether it be OCR, whether it be RPA sort of bots, whether it be um, sort of concept management systems, AI. linking into AI and, and that type of stuff. And, and it's getting cleverer and cleverer as well. I mean, mm. You listen to Elon Musk, he's sort of a little bit worried about how clever AI could actually get. But it's, um, and, and again, I suppose that touches on the fear factor. Some customers, especially the, the, the users, like, oh, it might put me out of a job type scenario. And to, to handle that, I suppose, um, it's not necessarily to, to put them out of a job. It's to actually free them up from doing the mundane tasks mm. so they can actually think, think like a human to be more human as opposed to, so use a robot where it's quite re, uh, repetitive and, and robotic and then use a human to actually be, mm. bring things to life, speak to a customer, be- um, Add value. Be, yeah, add value. And, and I guess um, the whole intelligent automation piece for me in that scenario, the human needs to sort of educate the staff. It's a cultural thing. It needs to come from the top as well because we've spoke to business owners at the top and you'll you'll get a new finance manager in or a new manager and they'll be like, why are we doing this? They'll ring us, we'll speak to them, spend a load of time. But if the, the person at the top have no interest in, in technology and they're still like paper and very, very tough to get something through and agreed in the first place. But even if it gets agreed, it's it's then delivering the project, making mm -hmm. it successful and getting it onboarded and getting everybody bought into it. So I think there's a, there's a bit of a cultural thing, but for the companies that have got that and they've got that ambition, um, which we're seeing more and more of now, um, yeah, th there's loads you can do with the technology. Are there some? Are there any specific sectors that we're working in the minute that are kind of adopting automation or? Yeah, John? I, I uh, yeah. So uh, manufacturing, professional yeah. services. Um, I was talking to a, a professional services organisation um, last week, and picking up on what Neil said, one of the things that a couple of people I was talking to were worried about was, well, that's my job. Mm. It's like, well, it, well, it's not all of your job, is it? Um, and they were like, obviously the mundane parts of it. And, and it was like, do you like doing that? Well, no, not really. Mm. And I'm always up against it. And it was like, well, okay, so talk me through it. So we, we did the whole audit of what they were doing in that particular task. Um, and then at the end, it was it, it kind of changed from being, well, oh, I'm, I'm suspicious. Mm. So by the end, it was like, oh, can it do this? Yeah, it can do that. Can it do that? Yeah. Yeah. They become oh, wow. The biggest That's sixty percent yeah. of what I do, which means I can spend more time doing a what I enjoy doing and b what makes the company more money, mm. being more efficient. And by the end of it, it was like, oh wow, if it can do that, can it? And then suddenly, all the other questions: can it do this, 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 and this? Um, and in the main, the answer is normally yes. Mm. There's there's areas, um, and then the other, uh, you know, fr from manufacturing orders coming in, and you know, taking information from a, a supplier's um, CSV file spreadsheet and then saying, right, well, we don't like their format. We have to now put the same information into our format. Mm. All right, why do you have to do that? Well, we have to do that, okay? If it's a, it, we have to do it and it's not changing, then, well, a bot can just go, all right, well, I'll go onto the portal or I'll take the information from said spreadsheet and I'll just put it in that spreadsheet and suddenly I can, free up that person's time to maybe do some more cross-selling and actually contact the client and go, I've noticed you ordered X, Y, Z. Have you thought about this to go with that? Oh, no, I haven't. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, you, just by taking that mundane, and you've touched on it a couple of times, Neil, the whole, you get blinded by just doing the same old, same old, and then mistakes creep in. And just for, for listeners, watchers that are not familiar with RPA, what, what are the different types of bots are they and how yeah, they so you, triggered and yeah you've got attended and unattended so you've got if you like you've got if there's a specific routine a flow of, of, of work that you do in a specific order you can quite easily just set the bot to do it you press go and it will just go off open an email take something out move it around and then spit out an end result or, or move data wherever you need it to be and it could be very simple um or you've got the unattended one where it'll just work in the background so again could be monitoring in an inbox as an email um, comes in every five seconds or whatever. It'll it'll grab that, pull it out, read the email, and push it where it needs to be. So 
Um, and you can have a mixture of both, really. So it, it could be where you want a little bit more control, but again, you want to leverage technology and free up your time. You could be, you wait for, I don't know, 100 items to build up, then you press go and it'll, it'll do it in yeah. 30 seconds. Um, or you get something where it is um, a task that's, yeah, that's got a lot of volume. You, you get the bot to sort of have it running in the background. And it, and it only needs to do part of the process. So again, a lot of the time, we still need humans in that end-to-end -end process. It's not going to do the full lot. It's just handing off certain bits and making sure that um, communication is done correctly. I mean, it, it can happen, I guess, I'm trying to think of a, an example in my real life where it's happened to a point, but then they've not obviously connected all the dots properly. Mm -hmm. So I ordered some garden furniture recently. I had a bad experience, and this is, again, part of the, 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 the customer journey, I guess. So the, the in-store thing was fine. And this is the difference between sort of bricks and mortar versus an e-commerce type thing, which we've talked about in the past and having the systems linked together. So the order was raised, got an email, all that type of thing. Um, got a text message, say it has been dispatched. Delivery company rang me, as you do with the time slot. The goods were damaged. Now, again, the goods were damaged, that takes it off down a different workflow. Mm -hmm their workflow to handle retained stock and goods was really, really poor. Now, I, I get it in terms of if it was just delivered and I signed it and it was all fine, that bit would have been great. The handling since it's not been delivered because it was damaged was appalling. First of all, they asked me to ring the, the delivery company, so they, they took it back. Then it was like, well, there was no handoff. There was no handoff between the delivery company reordering the stock. I had to then get back in touch with them to tell them that it was damaged. Mm. And then it, and then the process where there was supposed to be, I got emails to say that my stock was assigned to me. And then the other day I was chasing, sort of saying, where is my order? I got an email saying it was on the way. That was on the 11th, that was on the 11th of May when we've chased them now. Oh yeah, sorry, part three of the order's not in stock anymore. And actually, yeah, we're not doing it anymore. So we'll just cancel the order. Like, hang on, you haven't, I've had to chase you. You've not emailed me. You've not rang me. You've not. So this is where their system's completely br like broken. They've tried to automate it to yeah. a point, but the human bit in terms of ringing a customer and saying, yeah, sorry, Neil. Yeah, we couldn't get this part or whatever. Would you like this? Humans like to solve problems. We, we like to have that. And especially in that scenario and spending a lot of money, like their yeah, system's it's, broken. It's just not. As soon as it goes off that happy path, then yeah. it's yeah. not, it's not. So I'll ring up and sell them an RPS. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I want to go speak I to think them. the other thing on when it comes to RPA, I think there's two things. You mentioned it earlier around temporary staff. The, the, the beauty of bots is that they don't have to be a full-time thing. You don't have to have them working three, six, you know, three, six, five days of the year, 24-7. When you're coming up to a peak... And it's a, an admin peak, if you, if you like, you know, be it end of month or be it, you know, let's say professional services where they have, you know, tax years and et cetera, et cetera. Then you can just power up a, a bot, you know, granted there's the, the implementation to start with. Mm. But once you've done that and it knows, right, actually, I'm getting switched on again and I'm going to do this. You could use that in, in multiple sectors. You think about um, think about Christmas staff that have temporary staff in the retail yeah. world, like onboarding staff. We've yeah. spoken about that in the past. Of that is a process in itself mm -hmm. of getting collecting all the information from new starters, and and all of that can be used with with RPA. So yeah. onboarding of new staff, offboarding, all that type of students, thing. Students, stuff um, like that. Yeah, student seasonal workers would be in in sort of yeah food production and things like that um, works quite well. I mean that that's the the. The beauty, but also the challenge of these tools is it's finding the use case, it's finding the right area to actually put it into practice. But but on that, Steve, I think uh, uh, for me, it's um, at the moment, RPA has been around probably five, 10 years, let's say, but it's always been in your, your, your multi-billion pound, mm -hmm. dollar, yen, whatever sort of corporations. And, you know, and I think one of the things that we, feel is exciting is that actually we can now take it to the SME market and actually say, all right, you're experiencing this problem. Well, a bot can solve that. And, and it's unearthing those. So we've un, we've mentioned professional services, um, manufacturing, retail, mm. e-commerce, whatever. Um, it's it's actually going, do you know what? This this sort of tool can be used, you know, at a much 
you know, um, in a much smaller, you know, concise sort of manner rather than it's got to go into a massive, you know, global operation that mm. it's going to do that. You see that and, and they're utilizing it and they've been utilizing it for many, many years, but that's come at quite a cost. Yeah. Going back to the sector thing, I mean, I, my specialism at the moment, probably for the last year and a half, is probably wholesale and distribution. Um, and I'm seeing more in like food distribution as well. Mm -hmm. um, the frozen food sector seems to be growing exponentially within for, within food. And I think that came about through people trying to, yeah, one, the manufacturers want to extend the shelf life. But again, because of COVID and whatnot, people wanted that. They saw the, the rationing, if you like, of yeah. going to the shops and having the online orders that they were, yeah, frozen food's gone. And even like um, more and more soup, um, restaurants and things like that are using it. But the, is that in financial actual, automation or is that in, yeah in, in financial operators? automation so again but they're they're looking at it from a sales order so customer that i've looked at uh, helped at the moment they're looking at it as um capturing the orders as they come in but then that's going to have a knock-on effect because they don't retail anything they, they buy stock in um and again like they say that i mean the turnover is probably 45 50 million something like that it's a lots of lots of tins of beans if you like yeah. but again they've got a massive warehouse stock coming in stock going out distributing it out to the to the main sectors like uh, care and and um and education and things like that and more and more re uh, restaurants but the the they wanted to capture the orders accurately so again if they've, they've got that up front got the information um they can buy the right products at the right time then it's more about trends and things like that so again perishable goods they want to make sure that the food's in and out mm. as fast yeah. as possible um and then uh, they looked at the AP side of things. So again, they had two or three workers um, sat there keen in everything. And also things like statement reconciliation. So the bits and pieces around the edges of those processes can also be captured, which people don't think about until they dig into it. So again, reconciling bank statements, reconciling statements, reconciling... Um, supply statements yeah, coming in. The, yeah, the invoices suppliers. And, so you can flip yeah. and f you can flip it, sales ledger and purchase ledger, both sides really. It's very similar. So as long as it's a system generated um, order coming in, or even whether it be Excel, whether it be a form of some sort, struggles a little bit with the contextual. If it's just an email, can I have ten of these? Mm. Um, it'll struggle a bit. But as long as there's, there's enough data there, if it's got an order number on it and a quantity, then it'll have a go. But um, yeah, I, I see that that business sector, if you like, because um, it has been disrupted by the sort of e-commerce platforms where it's a bit like um, a compare the market type thing. So if someone wants to buy X amount of, of food, if you like, they'll go online, they'll they'll fill in the quantities and they're, they're acting like a bit of a middle it's marketplace. Man. They're like a, yeah, yeah a marketplace, well, like okay. a middleman. And then they they're, they're go into these distributors and saying, well, I've got an order for 10,000 of these. Can you fulfill that for mm -hmm. me? And, and a lot of the time they are, but these customers I'm speaking to are wanting to, to provide that service themselves to their customer base to make it easier. Because everybody, ultimately what we're trying to do is make it easier to do business. We mm. want to, people want to buy things, people want to order things, people want to sell things. And it's kind of, we just want that to be as, as, as painless as possible. When you start putting steps in the way, mm. more hoops to jump through, oh, fill out this form and do that form and upload this and upload that. Just, it just that, that whole experience becomes a, and I've mentioned, I've mentioned this before, like we're used to as, as consumers at home, buy now, just literally one button mm. and the goods are on the way and it arrives the next day. But then when we come into our business life, it's like, why is this so painful to deal with? And, 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 and I have seen a shift. Some people will shift suppliers, even if they've been with them 10, 20 years, if they're still saying, oh yeah, fax me an order type scenario. I know that's an extreme example, but if it's painful, they'll they'll go to someone that's slicker and quicker, mm. um, because everybody has to get things out the door, especially in the distribution world. They want it. They want quick turnaround as fast as yeah, possible. It's the Amazon but, effect. Isn't I, it? I think that's the thing. Just you know, um, looping back to to bots and things like that. Actually, the power of them being able to go and scrape information off websites. So I'm going to go and do a price comparison, or you know, I'm a wholesaler, whatever, and I'm going to say I've got. These these five products go and find me the you know the the, the comparison on mm. here are all of our competitors and and having bots go and do that graph that potentially you've got you know a human that 
could do something probably much more valuable in in the business like talking to suppliers yeah. actually going right here's here's all the data you need to go and say how come my competitor down in the south as an example is selling exactly the same product for this yeah i'm doing it that you know all those sorts of things and bots can just go and do that yeah i think we're, we're seeing bots more now as personal assistants yeah. more than anything else they're not replacing people but they're there to take away some of that laborious work that that's people don't need to do. Yeah, definitely. So you mentioned the term intelligent automation, which that's, that's the next big thing, isn't it? So I guess how, how intelligent is automation currently? Is it? Again, it depends on your budget and what, what you want to spend. I mean, <laughs> you can get free apps nowadays that you download on your mobile phone that, that'll do a lot more than you expect them to do. I mean, we've had it before where business card readers, it'll just take a picture of a business card and extract the data off now. But the stuff that you we're... You find all the examples, don't you? <laughs> wow. Just the stuff that I use in my, I suppose, my my day-to-day life. But um, the one where it's getting more and more intelligent is more around like the contextual. It's been able to read a document and actually understand what, mm-hmm. instead of just literally reading it and verbatim just taking each character off the page, it's able to read the letter, understand what, type of whether it be a contract or it be a big and, document and especially yeah especially in things like uh, professional services whether it be solicitors and, and whatnot they need that to because then it can root it to the necessary people or, or attach it to the necessary case that they're working on um and it can save people a lot of time mm. um even little things like uh, emails um i spoke to to one um company that was working specifically the developed like an email monitoring tool but they were charging like 30 grand a year for it and it sounded simple and all it was doing was reading the email and then just filing it away in a in a case management system mm. but in certain legal firms when you've got fee earners that, earn, that are charged out at x amount per hour you don't want them sat there in their admin going right what email is that related to okay that's related to that file and they're sat doing their own admin just copy and pasting yeah. and moving stuff into the into their sort of crm practice management stuff and again it comes down to that roi piece it's, it's a case of okay well, what does that person cost and at, what do we charge them out at versus yeah what what tasks are they actually doing and and can we can we yeah repeat that or get a bot to do something of that um i guess it, it, you mentioned around artificial intelligence earlier isn't it and it's it's, yeah. it's bringing that into the world of automation so instead of just if this then do that yeah using artificial intelligence to kind of make some contextual de- decisions around it exactly and and i mentioned uh, um bid documents if you think you know going well it's prevalent now but going forward i guess you know big government contracts or just big contracts will go out to tender as a, as a matter of course. Mm. And, and, and if you can receive a bid document and then put it through some software that can read that document and highlight, you know, very quickly, let's say it's a 150 page document because often they're war and peace, aren't they? Mm. I can highlight the top dozen reasons why we should carry on bidding, but actually also highlight the six to 10 reasons why red flag this needs further examination. And in, you know, let's say 70,000 words, it's taking you to those six key clauses or points that say, hmm, sounds interesting, sounds like it could be profitable, um, but we need to qualify this. And then also go back into like its memory and say, we've done projects similar to this and they ended disastrously. Let's just move on. Or, yeah, projects like this, we, been, were, we were successful in winning the tender. And uh, then it becomes self-learning. And yeah. that, I think that that is the next, that is the future for intelligent automation, taking it away from just automation. You see it in, yeah. in recruitment. I mean, these sort of websites, you can upload your CV and things like that. And it's got some AI in the background now where it'll be looking at the actual CV versus the job description and the, the person's mm. spec and, and comparing the two and, and then only putting forward to the next stage, he's kind of doing that first step of weeding out the, the sort of um, the piece pull that hit the criteria, and then where it, again, I'm suspicious of those. The software and the and the technology works, but when it and, and I guess you know if you're looking to employ you know one person doing you know software developer or whatever, probably not the greatest analogy, but 
uh, right, 100 CVs come in. Uh, yeah. I get sifting it down to I want the top 10, mm. get that. But when it's about, you know, potentially a role that is dealing with people, yeah, I think a black and white document Sometimes it's difficult. Can though. be a very just to, to sift something out and go. All oh, right, actually, do you know what? They haven't got the degree that I was looking for, or they haven't got this experience. And then sometimes you meet them, and you know you hear all these, you know, some of these you know, like dragons and whatever, and they're like, oh, I probably wouldn't have normally thought of you, but actually, off the charts, you know, mm. well done. So uh, for me, that's the sort of negative to that sort of technology. While it's really powerful and it would, it's working. It's probably more actually not the technology, it's more criteria that the people have put in and, and it's more ultimately what all software is about is saving time, isn't it? It is. All right, I think we'll leave it there. Thank you very much for your time. And Thank we'll you. Welcome we'll back, s- Wellesley. Welcome back from his <laughs> uh, month long in Florida. Yeah. No wonder they Spassible. sent his furniture back. <laughs> he wasn't there to receive it. <laughs> we'll see you next week.